glad to see you all here today. Welcome to the First Church of God. And um, it is a day that we can rejoice. We've, it's fun to have the back to school kinds of things happening. Um, boys found saying, out who their teachers are. Are you saying it's fun are. to get rid of the kids? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Thanks. Back to school definitely looks a little different. The supply list includes masks and hand sanitizer, but I'm, I'm thankful that St. John's gave the option for in-person. Um, and I know there's plenty of people still that are doing online too, which is also wonderful. But um, be in prayer for our teachers, for the staff in the school. There is so much unknown and change that's still happening, and there's stuff they're figuring out. So... It's a new experience even for the very seasoned teachers. So we're glad that you're here today and um, please join us in singing. <clears throat> Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. As we gather in this place, allow your spirit to fill our very being. As we worship today, we remember all those who are worshiping elsewhere throughout the world. Inspire us to work more faithfully for justice and the dignity of life everywhere we go. Lord, help us to see beyond the barriers that separate us. Give us wisdom as we deal with each other. Help us to recognize and respect di different ways rather than to judge. In the spirit of Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, we walk in this world. We reach out our hands with help and open hearts in love. Awaken a new desire in us to seek your way of serving people around us. Grant us your protection. Keep us from evil. Heal the sick, the brokenhearted, and the hurting. Make our paths straight as we follow after you. Amen. I have a few announcements I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one of them is, well, I'm going to say it now before I forget it. One of them is, is we get to have kids' church to, again. Does that make you happy? <laughs> so uh, when I tell you, you're allowed to go to the back, and, uh, and kids, we're going to have uh, kids' church. will be down in the Rainbow Place room in the fellowship hall. Also, uh, we've got a worship team meeting following the service, and I believe that is open to anybody who would like to be a part of it, either helping out in sound and video, uh, learning how to record the video, or, or playing or singing or anything like that. If you'd like to be a part of it, you're welcome to just remain here after the service. Also, our picnic. We've got a team of people that have been working hard to try to figure out how we can have a picnic in all this oddity that is 2020. And uh, we think we've found a way to do it. So right now, that is a definite on. And that'll be September 13th at City Park. Uh, but we need people to, if you think you're going to be there, we need you to sign up if you're willing. And so you can do that. There was an email that went around on Friday. Uh, you can do it. There's uh, Shelby, help me out. There's a paper copy back in the narthex uh, in the foyer right behind where the sound system is on that table. There's a, you can just sign your name there. Just let, we just need to have a, a, the real reason for this isn't anything too complicated. We need to know how much food to bring. So uh, if you guys could let us know if you're going to planning to come or not. If you think you're going to be there, we'd encourage you to sign up. That way we have the food. And if we don't, then there are plenty of us that can take care of that problem. <laughs> So uh, we just want to encourage you to do that as well. Uh, the other things just to be paying attention for, uh, again, we're trying to put together a video for church families. You can send information to the, the church office. And our discipleship group is continuing to meet every Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. There's multiple ways to engage with that. But uh, if you just want to show up and see what it's like, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we just meet... We usually have about 10 to 15. We usually just meet right back there in the foyer. If there's more than that, we'll come in here. Uh, but it's, uh, we meet at 6 o'clock, and we're usually done by 7 to 7.15-ish. Hey, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> we just need an alarm clock. That's what we need. That way I can hit snooze and continue to talk. Um, 
And the other thing is just, we're, if those of you that would like to give an offering, there's multiple ways. You've heard the story. We've been over this a lot. Uh, multiple ways to give. Uh, one of them is you can, if you brought an offering with you this morning, there's an offering plate right through the middle doors in the back. Also, on your way out, there's a, a, a box attached, bolted to the walls, a secure place. You can just drop a check or some cash or whatever it might be. And then uh, if you want to give online, all of that stuff works. I know that's what uh, my wife and I have been doing, and it's just nice and easy, and I kind of get Every time I get that email, thank you for your donation, I'm like, oh, yeah, we did it. Uh, and it's a good, positive thing. So you can give that offering. Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we stand in this place in your space, Lord, we just ask your spirit to work amongst us and within us. Lord, we remember those who are hurting today. We think especially of the Cyril's family. We pray for Stan and Millie. Lord, we think of all those that are moving in, even with this, uh, everything going on, moving into Michigan State this weekend, and the people that are hard at work trying to make that happen in an understaffed environment. Lord, we think of the kids going back to school and the teachers as they prepare. Lord, for all the decisions that people have to make, for all the stresses that people have in their lives. Lord, it's a mess, but you are not. And in you we find rest, in you we find peace, and in you we find hope. And even as we gather here this morning, may that just be the truth, a truth that we all cling to and know. And Lord, for the offering given today, Lord, may all that is given go for your purpose, for your glory. Lord, we thank you for being who you are. We are your people called by your name. And we thank you for the opportunity to serve. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I would like to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 28. Uh, Acts chapter 28, if you've got a Bible, if not, it'll be up there. Uh, but if you get to Acts chapter 28, verses 23 through 31, whoever gets there first, can you just flip to the next page and tell me what's there? Acts 28, verses 23 through 21, what's on the next page of your Bible? Romans. That means that we are done with the book of Acts after today. Uh, three months, 12 weeks of messages we've been in the book of Acts. And now we've come to the very end, the very last part of it. And I, I think it's important to see how this book ends, uh, to pay attention to what's going on uh, as we come to a conclusion here. So we're going to be in Acts 28, and we're going to read 23 through um, 31. And you can read in your Bibles, or it's on the screen behind me. After they had set a day to meet with him, and that's Paul, they came to him at his lodgings in great numbers, from morning until evening. He explained the matter to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he had said, while others refused to believe. So they disagreed with each other. And as they were leaving, Paul made one further statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will listen, you will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing. And they've shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. Let it be known to you then that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there, Paul lived there, two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Amen. And that's the period at the end of the sentence, the end of the book of Acts. And the big question that we've been asking throughout this entire book for the last three months is we've been trying to see how people responded to the message of God and how people responded to God's people. 
And that's been our, our big focus. How will we and those around us respond to the good news of Jesus? This is the last thing that Paul has to say in Acts. It's the last moment that we know of. It's our last bit of his life. Now, Paul is going to go to Rome, and tradition tells us that, that in Rome, uh, he's, he'll be executed without much fanfare. And so, that, but that's not how the book ends. It doesn't end with his death. It ends with the message that he gave all the way until his death, which I think is important. Paul spends all day explaining and telling all who would listen about Jesus. He did it using the law of Moses, Ten Commandments, and all the books, the first five books of the Bible. He did it using the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of these other prophets. He did it using all the holy scriptures that the Jewish people uh, held up and knew and, and spent a lot of time digging in to understand who God was through every available means. He explained the kingdom of God as best as he was able, using, again, his own experience as well. All that God had done in him and through him and taught him. From his experience that we started with Paul when he watched Stephen be stoned and held the coats of those who were doing the stoning, killing this man of God. Through shipwrecks and his own being stoned, through his salvation experience in Damascus, through all the journeys that he went on, through all the people he met, all the things that he saw, the kingdom of God was visible in all of it. And he brings that entire message forward to give to those who are willing to listen. And he spoke with a sense of urgency. I, people don't like that sense of urgency phrase when it's connected to sports. They're like, just play. But this is a sense of urgency. He doesn't know if he's going to be alive tomorrow. I mean, he's been arrested, captured. He's been put in chains. The last things that we read about him. He's not going to know freedom again in his life. He's being jailed as they did in the time and he's paying for it out of his own, own pocket but he does not have freedom. This is where he's at. This is what's going on. He needs to say what he needs to say. I wonder how we would approach a similar situation. If you didn't know if tomorrow was coming, how would you live today? What would you say and who would you say it to? You know, there are times in our lives, I think, when we have that question. When we start to, to get maybe a little, maybe it's just me, but I imagine I'm not alone in this. When, when things get a little heavy, when things get a little hard, and we start to say, what, what's, what's my life really all about? What, what really matters most? What am I going to say to my kids or my wife or my spouse? If I had that one last moment, what, what would I, how would I sum this up? What would rise to the surface? Another way to view it is, what if you could speak without any hindrance at all? Let's be honest. If you could say anything you wanted without any consequences, what would you say? Please, that doesn't exist right now. <laughs> but I think it's a good, a good question, a good thought to have. If you could speak without any consequence attached to it, what would come out of you? What would come out of me? I want to say that I would give praise to God and I would tell of all the things that God has done and I would encourage people of the love and the life and, and support people in that to be grace-filled. But I also know that I can be an angry human being at times. 
And I can get down on things, and I can get down on people, and I know that sometimes when I think there's no consequences, I can say things that I later regret. Even if it's just to the shower head. <laughs> if there was no consequence, and you could say anything you want, let the, the depth of whatever it is you're feeling, whatever it is that is in you come forward, what would it look like? Would it be a message that brought life to the world? Or would it be something harsher? Unfortunately, in today's world, it seems as if that when we're allowed to speak without consequences, some people call that Facebook, we say things that aren't all that welcome to hear. Paul spoke from the heart. This was the message of his life. This kingdom of God was not a concept. It wasn't a profession. It wasn't just something that he did and believed in. It was who he was. The message that he gave, it bubbled up from the very core of what made Paul, Paul. He's in prison. He's been treated unfairly. He's been pursued. He's been abused. He has every reason to complain about everything around him. He has not lived an easy life. He has the scars to prove it. But when given an opportunity to speak, Every single time, Paul speaks for Christ. Because the life that he saw and experienced in Christ outweighed the rest of it. Boy, I want that to be my testimony too. I would love to say that that is where I am. In fact, I hope I can come within a, at least seeing that goal. Because that's a good life. It's a good life. What matters most to Paul comes out. And in the moment when we think there's no consequences, what matters most to us will come out. And if what comes up isn't something that honors God or looks like the things of God, then that is a moment for us to reflect, to re-examine, to dig into maybe some places within ourselves we haven't gone before, and to invite Christ, the Holy Spirit, the light into it. Because the God who gives life, gives life to all things, including the pain, the hurt, the anger, and the, the ugliness that we hide away from the rest of the world. The kingdom of God, it mattered to Paul God's continuing presence and work in this world was a topic that he could not shut up about. And he knew what he was talking about. This kingdom of God is the primary subject of the New Testament. It was the primary message that Jesus himself brought to the world. How many parables did he tell about the kingdom of God? Salvation itself is wrapped inside of the kingdom of God. It is the source of of life. It is a source of hope and peace and mercy and forgiveness. It's a source of our motive, our foundation. It is the presence and the will of God that, that overcomes all other things, that, that solid ground upon which we can stand that will shape every choice and action that we have from that point forward. It's a kingdom of God that has no beginning and end goes for the all eternity and as part of the kingdom of God a child of God that means that we also have no end eternal life safe in the arms of God this kingdom of God concept it is not an idea it is a reality and salvation is an entry point yes it is an entry point into that kingdom that we're invited into and eternal life begins then. We're living it now. 
this idea, it will reshape how we do everything else if we let it. It changed the world. How will you respond to the kingdom of God? How did they? It says some were convinced. They heard the arguments. They listened to the stories. They saw Paul for who he was, and they heard however he explained it with whatever passion and eloquence that he might have had, and they were convinced. They said, this is true. This is right. This is the way. This Jesus thing is, this is what we're going to do from now on. They were convinced. They recognized the truth and they reacted appropriately. But some also refused. They did not agree with the message of Jesus and the kingdom of God as it was explained by Paul. Their view of God was different than Paul's. And they said, no, 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 Paul, you're wrong. You're wrong. This is how it is. Not, not like you've explained it. This is how we know it, and that's how it is. And so they refuse to believe. And so what happens when some are convinced and some refuse to believe? Anybody want to take a shot at that? An argument. A disagreement breaks out. Paul's last recorded teaching contains an argument among those who he was talking to. Paul speaks, he speaks from morning until night. You guys think I go long when I go over 30 minutes. Morning until night, he is giving this story. I imagine there was a potty break in there somewhere. And at the end of it, they chose to argue. What is an argument? An argument is not a place of thoughtful consideration. An argument is a place where people stake out their viewpoint and they defend it from a different one. Have any of you ever been in an argument? Today. It happens all the time. And, and we have these emotions that bubble up when we do it, right? You get in these arguments, and I know I, I, I used to argue politics with my mom all the time, mostly just to poke the bear and see what would happen. Um, I don't do that anymore because it's not any fun anymore. But you get in these arguments, and, and people, their emotions start to bubble. And they get more animated. And in my family, that means we get loud. Not, not my immediate family. My boys are always loud, and my wife is never is. But in the family I grew up in, anytime there was an argument, or really just any time, people got loud. Not yelly, screamy loud, but they were just, the voices went up, the volume got turned up. And so you get in these arguments and the volume starts to get turned up and people start to, to sharpen their wits on you. Anybody ever had that happen? And all of a sudden, you, you might be talking about this one thing and it shifts into this other thing and it shifts into this other thing and all of a sudden you're... You're in places that you never thought to go, but then you're still in it. You're still like, I'm going to defend this position. And basically, it gets to the point where no matter what the other person says, you're against it or for it. This is not a place of reasonable, thoughtful consideration. Maybe your arguments are different, but I doubt it. They're that different. We get into these places where we just stake out our spot. And the emotions bubble and boil. You ever gotten an argument about something that doesn't matter and end up being something that really does matter? You get in an argument about who put the napkins where. I just picked napkins because I figured anybody that argues about napkins is going to argue about anything. And the next thing you know, you're not speaking. Or somebody's left the house. Because it got personal. This is what happens when we get in these arguments. We stop listening and we start reacting. Reacting. 
reasonable discussion becomes a personal attack or reasonable discussion is received as a personal attack. Arguments get heated and a lot of unprocessed emotion can enter in. What if we were willing to take seriously a perspective that was different than ours, whatever that perspective might be? What if instead of staking out the ground that we say this is right and that is wrong, we were able to listen without being threatened? That maybe somebody else's viewpoint even if you don't agree with it, even if it's completely wrong, the fact that you're willing to listen to it will open a door that will help them process it. Nobody really wins an argument. There's some things we do need to argue over. There, don't get me wrong. It's just part of life. But if the goal is for us to come together, if the goal is for us to understand one another, if the goal is for us to love and be loved, then a listening ear and an open mind will go a lot further than a loud mouth. Paul listens to the argument. He listens. He doesn't enter in. He listens to the argument. He listens to them disagree with each other over the things that he just said, as if the expert in the room is not sitting right in front of them. He listens. And then he says, you will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. Look what's going on right now. Look what's happening in your disagreement. He's quoting Isaiah. It's not just Paul. Paul didn't come up with this. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah, who spoke to a similar group of people in a similar situation. You will look but not see. You will listen but not hear. You're there but you aren't here at the same time. You ever had a conversation with someone who's just simply not comprehending what you're saying? Anybody? Again, we'll go back to family. I can speak from my own. Those arguments, it's, it's what happens. Sometimes we start to talk and it's, it's what you say doesn't matter because the other person's just waiting for you to shut up so they can tell you what you should think. And that's more common than not, honestly. We're there, but we're not there. We're listening, but we're not hearing. Paul calls them out in the middle of their disagreement, in the middle of their argument. And he uses the prophet Isaiah to do it. You look, but you don't see. You listen, but you do not hear. You're not getting this. And you're not even trying. It is possible for two people to see the same thing at the same time and have completely different descriptions of that event. Imagine that with issues of faith. Sometimes when we limit ourselves to what we already know, then we will close ourselves off from seeing what God wants to teach us. When we limit ourselves to what we already know, we close our minds to what God is actively, actively doing. Actually, actively doing. See, I got it right the second time. In our midst. That's what Isaiah is writing about. And that's what's happening here. Look, look, they don't see. Listen, 
They don't hear because their eyes and their ears only want to hear what they want to hear. Only what to see what they're willing to see. And they're not willing to go beyond that. It is possible for God's people to see God at work and explain it away when it doesn't match up with with how they think God should work. And there you have one of the biggest problems with the church in the last 20 to 30 years. God works. And God's people say, wait, that's different. It doesn't look like what I know. It doesn't sound like what I've experienced. So it can't be of God. I've watched church folks explain away salvation itself because it didn't look the way they thought it should. God's people should always respond to God's spirit at work amongst us. And if we can't or aren't, it's a listening and seeing problem. And we are what the prophet Isaiah and what Paul is talking about. For this people, Paul goes on, for this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. Dull hearts. Ears that do not hear, eyes that are shut, actively working to not look, to not listen, to not understand. Anybody here ever worked with a dull tool? Anybody? Does anybody have an injury or scar from using a dull tool? You know, sometimes you get a dull tool and and you go at it and it just means you got to work 10 times harder, right? Like, all right, the chainsaw blade, it's dull. So we're just going to just keep at it for a while and see how long it takes to get through that log. One time I had to cut through this pipe. My dad had me doing this in his veterinary hospital. There was this, it was a, some kind of metal pipe. It was about that big. And he gave me, it was tucked away in a corner, and he gave me this little hacksaw, but not one that's like the full wraparound hacksaw, where you can like get a good grip on it. It was one of those that just had a handle and a hacksaw blade <laughs> at the end of it, and it wasn't new. So that hacksaw blade was not the sharpest. It took me half a day. And you're just in there going And I'm fortunate I didn't get hurt, because you're laying down in a corner, and you're just sawing with this thing, and you're not getting anywhere. Has anybody ever been that? Has anybody ever been there and complained to your dad and told to get back to work? I got it done. What I wouldn't have given for a sharp blade and a proper tool. Paul calls out dull hearts. And dull hearts, they make everything ten times harder than they needs to be, if not more. And that's just in the normal stuff. And the relatively easy, safe stuff. Do you want your surgeon to have a dull blade? Faith is greater than that. And dull hearts cause injury to ourselves and the people around us. It stops us being able to do what God has called us to do. A dull heart hurts. It is the opposite of iron sharpening iron. So why would ever anyone ever want to be dull? Some of you are like, we've been listening to you talk for almost 20 minutes. We get dull. We understand now. But think about it. Why would any of us ever want to have a dull heart? I don't think any of us would say, yes, we do. 
but we do. We just don't think about it. We just don't engage it. We just go about our routine. We go about this and this and this, and we keep walking the same paths. We don't ever sharpen the blade. We don't let anything new come into our heart and mind. We don't process the emotions and the things that are happening around us. And it just dulls and dulls the heart to the point of numbness. Anybody ever been numb? We get there. Spiritually, we get there. It's numb. And God could be knocking on the door of our heart with all passion. And we can't even hear it anymore. Because our heart is dull. We haven't opened it up. We haven't used it. We haven't allowed it to expand and see what's around us in so long that we don't even know how to do it anymore. So we argue over napkins. We stake out our territory that we think is safe and secure and say this way and no other. And we protect that dull heart so that no one else would know, so it would never be revealed. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to admit that maybe there's more to learn or maybe we've had it wrong. And the only result of that is the heart gets duller and duller and duller. And when we're called to sharpen one another, to help each other, to engage, to to more fully understand, to more fully live out this faith, this eternal life that God has given us, we actually end up ignoring one another or being unwilling to listen and unwilling to see and unwilling to open our heart to each other. And the end result is dullness. And dullness creates injury. We choose dullness over healing. Paul speaks and he says these words so the Holy Spirit might bring understanding, repentance, and healing. Turn, understand. The desire of God is to heal, to bring healing. He spoke to people who needed this truth and his message isn't death, it's life. The message of Christ is always life, eternal life. The prophet's message, Isaiah's message, was rooted in the same foundation. The message of life, a message of healing, a message of hope. And so Paul's last recorded message ends in a warning. But that warning is attached to a promise. He warns them about closed ears. He warns them about shut eyes. He warns them about closed hearts. But he also says, turn. Understand, heal. Has anybody ever taken a dull knife and made it sharp again? It happens. And a tool that might have been harmful becomes a tool that is necessary. The Lord wants to sharpen our hearts. He wants to sharpen our lives. He wants to give us that life that bubbles up in a never-ending fountain, a never-ending life, eternal, in his kingdom, as his child. He wants to give you the life that can engage this world and not be overcome by it, not be pushed down by it, but it is a sharp enough knife heart to engage this world in a way that looks like Jesus. Jesus was never dull. And the way that Jesus interacted in this world brought life. It brought light. It changed things. And he gives us the same capacity to do that. He said, you'll even do greater things than this. He wants to sharpen us. If we would turn Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, listen and see. He will sharpen our hearts and show us what life is all about. Do you think the world could use this today? Paul says to them, let it be known to you then 
that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. In other words, the people that aren't you. The salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. God will not be silent. My inability to see and to listen and to understand does not stop God from speaking, showing, and helping people understand. And if you will not listen, if you will not open your eyes and your heart and your mind to this, then guess what? Others will. We don't get to stop God from being God. Our opinions and our understandings and their limitations simply cannot contain God. He, you can't shut him down. The work's going to go forward. The work is going to continue. His message will carry beyond the arguments and the opinions and the problems that we have. And from this people, this message will go forward. From these Gentiles, from those who are different than you, from those who don't look or act like you, from those that you've rejected if he's talking specifically to Jewish people at this point, from those that are not like you at all, this message of God has taken root and it's going to continue today. And that's us, by the way. Because you're not going to silence God. We're not going to stop God from working. Any good argument we come up with is limited to small to nothing compared to what God is already doing. And when I think I've got all of this figured out, that's the time I need to stop, look in the mirror, call myself an idiot, and shut up. Because God's way is larger than me. And the work of God is larger than this moment that we are in. How do we face a world filled with this silliness that's going on now? That's so big, I can't even name it as one thing. We trust God who's bigger than all of it. And we go forward. And we live on that foundation of life that will not end. We live sharp. Hearts engaged. We live looking like Jesus as best we know how. And we trust that Jesus will use the people around us to sharpen us further, and we welcome that. It's one of the reasons that we do what we do with discipleship and adults. Yes, sometimes we have conversations that get awkward. Good! How long has it been since you've had a genuine conversation with someone that thinks differently than you, where you listened? That's how we get sharpened. The Holy Spirit works in these moments. Let's welcome it, not run from it. So Paul kept teaching. He was given a gift. He's in prison at his own expense. He has two more years. He stays right there. And anybody that showed up at his door, he taught about the kingdom of God. He talked about the kingdom of God. He shared what was going on and why it was happening. He went deep and he went with people. They listened, they heard. Some were convinced, some refused. The same story gets played out time and time again. Still played out today. Some will be convinced and some will refuse to listen. Okay, but that doesn't stop the message of God and doesn't stop the need to speak it. And you might think, well, don't you have to be a pastor? No, you don't. You just have to follow God. Just because somebody stands up here with a microphone doesn't make them smarter than anybody else in this room. We all do this together. God's people sharpening each other, living, going forward. So how are we going to respond? It's a question we've been asking for the last three months, right? I'm going to start something new next week. The question we've been asking for the last three months, how are we going to respond to this message? Let's not respond with an argument. Well, I agree. Well, I don't. Okay. Rinse, wash, repeat. Nobody gets anywhere. Let's respond with faith. Let's listen. Not to a person. Let's listen to the Spirit of God. That truth 
that bubbles up from deep within. That truth that is larger than the problems of the world around us or the problems of the moment. And let's find the people around us that are doing the same thing. Let's work together. Let's sharpen each other. Let's let the Holy Spirit work in the midst of it. Iron, sharpening iron. And know that the life that comes from that, the message of life, the foundation of the kingdom of God built on creation, recreation, life, and all these other big theological concepts. But the bottom line is that you are a child of God and you have life and you get to live it forever. And it's beautiful. Let's live there. You're not going to solve a problem with an argument, but you got a shot with faith and grace and mercy and understanding. If they would just open their eyes and see, if they would just listen with their ears and hear, they would open their minds. I would cause them to understand. They would turn and be healed, said the prophet Isaiah. It's just as true today as it was the day he wrote it. So let's do it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, this morning we gather here in this place and we ask that your spirit would speak to us or that you would guide us and you would shape us. You would cause us to sharpen one another as we are made alive in you. That this message of the kingdom would bubble up from within us, not as a, a concept or an argument or a story to tell, but as the very core of who we are. Because we are your child saved by your grace, welcomed into your kingdom. Lord, help us to speak truth in love. Help us to hear truth in love. Cause us to listen, to see, and to know. Lord, the life that you've put before us is not a tragedy. It's not a never-ending series of problems. It's an opportunity. And you will show us the path forward if we are willing to listen, turn, and follow you. Lord, bring your healing to each and every one of us and all of us together. And Lord, we give ourselves to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we get ready to go today, just in encourage and invite you to, to live out the faith that you have. To have the conversation you need to have in a way that looks like Jesus. To listen. To see. To understand. To experience the healing that only God can give. Go from this place today knowing that there is life. There is hope. And there is joy in the Lord. Amen? Amen. May God bless you this week.